Fun story, that was the first rated R movie I ever saw. <laughs> I did not handle that responsibility well. <laughs> and so it was the last one I saw for a while. Um, I'm so excited to be here with you all today uh, to learn from you and to share over the next 30 minutes or so what we're learning at United Way. Um, we're going to go into just a really brief overview of United Way as you understand what kind of issues we're trying to tackle in communities and then talk about our innovation process. For the bulk of our time, I'm going to spend talking about how we engage people in our crowd and some of the cool tricks that we're learning to keep people engaged. And then finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about where we want to take this journey in the future. And this is only our first year with IdeaScale, um, but we have some pretty big plans. All right, again, my name is Edwin Gutierrez. Um, I work for United Way, which is a nonprofit, for those who don't know. Uh, we fight for the health, education, and financial stability of every person in 1,800 communities around the world. It's a really big organization with like 10,000 staff. Um, I actually work for our corporate headquarters, United Way Worldwide, and I'm on our innovation team. Uh, usually people are actually pretty surprised to find that we have an innovation team. Um, and so I end up in these like strange, trying to explain the role of my team and my job, until I got some advice where someone said, just explain your job as uh, the most common customer feedback that you get. And so I like to think of myself as United Way's chief. That's not what I think of when I think about United Way, <laughs> but I mean that in a good way. <laughs> Classic CT. Oh, oh. 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 <laughs> So it's not, it's, you know, it's not a surprise that we get that feedback. We're a nonprofit organization. We have to keep overhead down. We're like over a century old. So um, I'm not surprised when people are shocked to find that we have an innovation department. Um, but innovation has been part of United Way's DNA from the very beginning. So we were started in 1887 in Denver. Um, there was a group of community leaders who got together to talk about how industrialization was bringing new social issues into their community. And so uh, a meeting was held. A priest, a rabbi, a minister, and a businesswoman. I promise I'm not sitting on the, the joke. <laughs> this is the actual attendee list. Uh, they got together, and they decided on two things. One, that there should be an organization that could kind of vet the requests that were coming in. And two, there should be a combined appeal to people who had the means to give back. So that Every organization wasn't going one by one to companies and wealthy donors. Uh, Frances Wise Bart Jacobs here was the businesswoman in that meeting, and she's, you know, considered one of the founders of United Way. We still play that same role today. Uh, where, you know, 130 years later, we are still the community problem solvers in local communities. We're still the conveners of people who are interested in getting together and talking about how we can better live out the terms and conditions of our social contract, that's still United Way's role. But we've had to innovate over time to make sure that we're keeping up with both the marketplace and the shifting needs in our communities. Uh, so I see United Way as a really innovative organization, but I also completely understand the perception that we're not. One issue is that we're not innovating frequently enough. Earlier today we heard about how quickly knowledge is, is doubling over time. Um, and business cycles are moving so quickly, we're not pushing out new ideas and new opportunities for people to get involved as fast as we should be. And then the second issue is in this new you know, era of the individual where you have a recommendation engine telling you which movie to watch when you get home later, um, it's difficult for us to involve people in giving back in a way that feels modern because People are used to understanding United Way as a, a trusted entity that they can give their money to and will invest it in a, a good place, but that's not how the world is working anymore. There's no more intermediaries. People want to be able to give back the way they feel passionate about giving back. So how can we use the, the new technology that's available to change the way that we are, um, change our value proposition to individuals and communities? And so, with that in mind, we created a very simple uh, innovation framework. Um, this is actually adopted from a couple of Stanford professors. It's called the Organizational Capacity Continuous Innovation. Um, and so we brought this in-house, and we knew early on that 
this is a framework that requires volume. It's got to take a lot of ideas to get a few that bubble up to the top. And so we knew uh, we were going to go with idea scale about four months into our 14-day trial, uh, we called and we said, we really want to buy a package of licenses. Um, so we ended up buying 15 licenses all at once. The first license that we created was internal. It's uh, for us to source, vet, and test ideas from our employees around the world. And so uh, this is something where you can submit an idea. Uh, we have a group of people who will vet your idea against the standard criteria. Um, we will put some funding towards testing that idea in the marketplace, and then we make decisions based on those tests, what we're gonna do with your idea. If it's unclear, we can retest the idea and try again. If it's bad, we can stop doing it, uh, which is actually a really, really fun thing to do if you're in a nonprofit, because there's so many times where you continue to do work that's not making any results. Um, or if it's successful, we can formalize an idea as a product, as a process or a promising practice that we can share with our United Ways across the network. Uh, from this, this year, we've already created a new digital product for our corporate partners where an employee can write, digitally write a note of encouragement to, let's say, a kid on the waiting list for a mentor. And United Way finds a way to deliver physical cards to kids in that community. We've, create, we've invested in VR experiences where um, our donors or stakeholders would be able to understand the experiences of the people who we serve. Um, so we're getting, we're getting great results in terms of the ideas that are coming through and we're excited about the reaction we're getting from our companies. And then for external ideas, we also purchased 14 additional licenses, gave them to United Ways around the country so they could do this crowdsourcing with their constituents. And we uh, just implemented an idea last week in Miami, last Saturday, where we created a food desert um, in a, or sorry, we created a, a garden in a food desert in Miami with the support of young leaders implementing an idea from their platform. And so uh, we learned a lot. 15, 15 communities is a really great testing ground. Um, and so here are just three tips that we've, that we've come up with. Um, the first is to become a scientist on the engagement side. So some of you are thinking, I already am a scientist, but that's your role. Um, Great, you have a head start on, on me when I first started. Um, but you can also take that into the way that you engage people in your community. So whenever we see an issue with a metric or an opportunity for uh, success, instead of um, you know, just doing what we think will, will fix the problem, we invest time in creating a hypothesis, we uh, create a test, and we measure the results. So this is a specific example here where we had Pretty low retention. This is a cohort analysis. It shows, you know, from the week of August 6th through August 12th, we only retained about 2% of people who went into the platform one week after the first time they logged in. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we could retain more than 2% of the people who were joining our platform because we want this to be a vibrant conversation with lots of people. We created an onboarding series. It's a three email series um, spread one week apart. And each email just gives you a little bit of information about how you can be more proactive in the community. Um, voting, making comments, sharing ideas. With that, we increase retention by six times in the first week. And we also have uh, now, looking forward, even until week six, we're seeing the same effects of higher retention rates than we had before. This is during a time where we had no active campaigns running. We wanted to, we want, we want to make it like a, an always on community. Um, and so when we actually have campaigns running and there's a big push of people who are coming into our platform, we'll be able to retain them at a much higher percentage than we would otherwise. All right, so the second is to become a data skeptic. And this is gonna be surprising to colleagues that I work with at United Way, because I'm seen as like, the super optimistic person who like disproportionately celebrates small milestones. Um, but what they don't see is every time I get a good piece of uh, data or successful, you know, you know, a successful intervention, I take the tinfoil hat out of my desk and I'm trying to figure out like who's conspiring to make me think I did a good job, but it's not actually true. Um, so two really tangible ways that you can bring this kind of data skepticism into your work. The first is to like throw out all the vanity metrics that you look at now 
um, things like page views and um, even to a certain extent registered users are good, but they might not lead to or correlate as strongly with some of the downstream metrics in your innovation process that are actually going to drive innovation. Uh, the second piece is even when you um, come to which metrics are going to guide your work, we landed on monthly active users and weekly active users as our, our big two. Um, always, even if you see success, you want to take that good news and kind of put it on the witness stand and find corroborating evidence. So we use multiple, um, we always have like more than one graph that shows the success and we want to ask why a few times to understand what's happening. So um, we were trying to hit 300 monthly active users in our platform during our pilot. Uh, we kept flirting with it, getting to like 298 and never really crossing it until we, in we used the onboarding series. Um, so we could have just been satisfied that there was an intervention and we hit the number that we wanted to hit, uh, but we wanted to make sure that it was not like a fluke or we didn't have you know, new registered users coming in that were inflating the number. And so um, we went back to our hypothesis and we said, if we're really making this happen because of the onboarding series, we're gonna see an increase in returning user traffic. But the, the new users might stay the same, but the returning users should be increasing. And in this bottom chart you see, you know, it's, they're pretty, pretty much side by side between new and returning users. And then when we, when we implemented the onboarding series, we start to see that separation. And so we were, com we were confident at that point that we were in fact the reason why uh, we were hitting that number. All right, and then the last is, you know, the first two were more about the science, this is more about the art. Um, you have to become a storyteller in your community. So I love graphs. I'm so excited about the new uh, dashboard feature in Idea Scale. Like that gives me so much life every day when I go to Idea Scale. Um, and nobody else cares about it outside of the people that work on Idea Scale with me. Um, so when we communicate to people who aren't on the innovation team, don't have innovation in their title, uh, we switch to story mode. So. Um, it's, it's pretty simple. We look for opportunities to talk about the, uh, the things that get us excited. I remember the first time we sent out a big story communication to our, our email news list. Um, it was, it was, I was going to send an email that was like, uh, hey, we're up 3% on engagement and we have 50 ideas in the platform. And then I went through the platform, was just looking at some of the ideas and something cool was happening. There was this great discussion about 360 video and everybody was chiming in about how I used to work at a place where this was part of my job. I have a camera at home. And so I just wrote that up as the story and I sent it out to the, to the, um, the news list. And the responses I got back, even from our CEO, were so different from the responses we used to get back for like the more factual email. Uh, the reason why it's so important to do this is when you build emotional resonance with your product, that's what keeps people from switching back to the other ways that they might have um, communicated ideas in the past. I remember the first time when we first launched Idea Scale, um, <laughs> we had a meeting at work, uh, we had an ideation session, we sent everybody back to their desk, we were like, okay, go use Idea Scale, and we sent an email with the link to Idea Scale. And I get a reply, a reply from someone that's like, you know what would be a cool idea? And they describe their idea in the email. <laughs> like, what are you doing? <laughs> um, so obviously they found the substitution to idea scale at that point that felt more natural to them, that they liked better, and so they used that. So we're trying to build that um, emotional response to idea scale that people will enjoy this more than they will what they're doing right now. So. Um, with everything that we learned, it hasn't all been, you know, science experiments and kumbaya stories and all that. Um, there have been some uh, things that we've learned that I'd love to share with you as well. Um, there, the issues that we ran into are probably most closely tied to like one single blind spot in our um, launch of our innovation platform, and it was that like we had a mandate to bring innovation more into the culture. And for some reason, we didn't see that as a cultural change initiative. Mm -hmm. And so we missed like the change management techniques that were required to, to really deliver. 
And so there were like two reoccurring characters that kept coming up in our community that um, negatively affect engagement. And so the first we actually already heard about earlier, <laughs> highest paid person's opinion. And then sometimes this kind of manifests as like the Steve Ballmer, the character um, who's kind of dictatorial about their idea of being best because they're highest up in the organization. There's another way it manifests that's like almost more insidious, and it's like when someone with a high position shares their idea, and it's an organization that has historically looked to people higher up in the hierarchy for, um, for direction, everyone else just kind of acquiesces because the person who has traditionally been the idea provider has provided their idea. And so it's, it's even harder to work around that because it's not just the one person you have to coach, but the entire community has to understand that they still have a role to play in this meritocracy of ideas. And then the second is a jellyfish. I don't know why I went with animals, but it just felt right and I went with it. Um, so I, I imagine, I've never been stung, but I imagine being stung by a jellyfish is like one of the worst experiences ever. Not so much because of the pain of it, but like, you were probably doing something awesome right before you got stung, <laughs> right? You're like either snorkeling or like at the beach with your friends and family, and then your life is searing pain and your day is ruined. And so sometimes we have these kinds of jellyfish at work. Like there's somebody who has that stinging comment that they can leave on an idea, and all of a sudden like the life has been sucked out of the room. And it's, um, you, you've probably heard them before. It's like, we've tried this a thousand times. Um, you know, we, that'll never work is a, a common one. And so this understanding um, that this is an issue is something that you'll have to work through. A few ways that we have found are super helpful. Um, one, clear community guidelines. It's not that people will go into your community and automatically read the community guidelines page, but having something to point back to to say, look, these are our norms, these are how we have chosen to behave is something super important that Whitney taught me. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> the second is through community uh, management, you can actually shift the conversation from um, somebody feeling attacked to the entire organization learning why that idea didn't work last time. You can have a conversation and say, well, um, you can share what happened last time and we can go through it and we can understand how the environment has changed and maybe there's an opportunity for us to try this again. Uh, the third is executive sponsorship. I'm really lucky because it was our CEO's idea to do crowdsourcing, so I, I definitely have um, some great backing there. Um, but having somebody on the C-suite on your side is really important. The fourth is workplace or work plan integration. Some organizations have kind of a set aside where X percent of people's time is devoted to innovation. At United Way, we do it differently. Innovation is one of our core competencies. And so it's, it's kind of like being rated on your character. And um, innovation, creativity, risk taking, risk taking are all part of that core competencies that we get rated on. So it, it helps to be able to fall back on um, you know, this is something that the person should be doing, so if you're inhibiting that, and you're going against the grain of the organization. And then the last is one-on-one -on -one meetings. So it's important to remember that um, hippo, jellyfish, those aren't necessarily people. It's roles that we can all play at certain points in time, and it's often driven by fear. Right? It's like scarcity, or new people are, are coming into the sandbox, and you're not, you're not one, like, really wanting to play with them. One-on-one um, -on -one meetings have been shown to be 34 times more effective than email communication and other forms of communication, and particularly for something where you need to find out what the motivation is of the person to change their behavior. All right. And so uh, our next steps at United Way, um, we're, we're incredibly excited. We're so glad that we went with IdeaScale and that um, we're seeing the results that we're seeing this early on. Um, we're gonna double down and make sure we do like a network-wide push to get all 10,000 of our staff to be up in you know, countries around the world to participate in IdeaScale. Um, and then externally, we're gonna continue to work with Local United Ways to find the right use cases for them to bring that to their communities. Uh, the survey results from our external communities um, aggregated here were really positive. 80% of people participating 
Um, we're satisfied with the experience. We're going to continue to work to get that even higher. But that was like pretty amazing for a six-month pilot where um, we were sprinting the entire time. Even better, the feedback that we got was exactly what we were hoping for. Uh, donors said, said it felt modern. They said it felt inclusive. Um, and then we got this great email from someone in Miami. Um, it's a donor who has been fundraising for United Way since second grade, collecting pennies in a jar. <laughs> and then the day after his birthday, we sent out an email to the community saying that his idea was going to be implemented. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if our Miami staff like checked the donor database to see if his date of birth was on record before they did that, but that's like amazingly serendipitous. Um, and just the, you know, the words that he shared with the Miami staff and with all of us really solidified why we're in this business. All right, and so uh, the second thing we want to do is um, beyond the geographic campaigns that we run, so like, you know, Miami will have its own campaign or Broward County, things like that. We would love to take this into our, our existing and new corporate partners and say, you have an incredibly talented workforce. How can we work together on solving sector challenges and catching up with where everybody else is on artificial intelligence? Is there an opportunity for us to talk about what the sector can do in blockchain, how that can change development around the world? And so that's an opportunity. We're talking to a few corporate partners now, and we're really, really excited about where that can take us. Um, but ultimately, I feel like the Every time we launch a community, it's just like an opportunity for us to relive that moment in Denver in 1987. It's like bringing people together to talk about how we can make the world better. And it's, it's been like the most fun thing I've worked on since I started with United Way 10 years ago. And so I just want to thank you all again for uh, letting me speak and look forward to learning more from you while we're here. Any questions? Uh, your, your standard vetting, vetting criteria. You know, for ideas. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Um, so there's a the Stanford group. The article that they published also has their four lenses for standard vetting. We added a couple. Well, they are like um, a political lens. Um, you know, is it politically viable? Uh, I can't remember what the four of them are, but it's. Organizational capacity for continuous innovation is the name of the framework. And CELOS, S-E-E-L-O-S, is one of the authors, and that will get you to it. We added um, scale across communities in ours because we have all these local United Ways, and sometimes when we submit ideas, it's perfect for um, you know, Mumbai. It's not perfect for every city in India or every city around the world. So. Um, scale was one of the big ones, and on brand for United Way was another big one. So, you know, we don't want to do anything that feels negative or combative. It's um, it's got to be true and authentic to us. Your community guidelines are those on your community that we that we yeah. can see? Um, our our idea lab community, our internal one, is private. It's like through single sign-on, um, but I can definitely share it with somebody at Idea Scale and make sure that that gets. To, to you all. The graph you were showing where you did to help you stick it in, I didn't quite understand what, what encouraged that. What was the, what was the thing that happened? Uh, we instituted the onboarding series and um, started sending email that we engaged <coughs> people in the community. And so our monthly active users was, before it was really just fed by the new users who found the platform and were participating. Now it's fed by those same, that same rate of new user growth and uh, returning sessions from people who have already been on the platform. And so I think our month-to-month our -month retention rate is like 50% now. So um, when we move to the 10,000 um, 10, staff in the network, uh, that's an opportunity for us to have like almost more influence than our internet. But I won't say that to our learning team. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Of course. Yeah.